Okay, so we have been studying through the book of Revelation. We started out with the church age. And this is, again, the review on the screen. The church, first three chapters. The rapture and the true church in heaven, chapters 4 through 5. Um, and then we see a, a kind of overview of part of the great tribulation, starting with the rise of the Antichrist, which is about chapter 11. So it's like an outline of chapter 11 onward. And then we go through chapter 7, which is the sealing of the 144,000. And then we went back to Daniel, and we'll do that again today. We went back to Daniel chapter 9 to get some keys to unlock some concepts and ideas for the Great Tribulation, for the book of Revelation. The length of the Great Tribulation, remember the midpoint, all those kinds of things about there's a midpoint, there's a first half, and there's a second half. It's similar to like a football game, you have first half and second half, but there's not breaking in quarters, so it's just first and second half. And then uh, last week we started with the beginning of the four of the seven trumpets, trumpet judgments, and those all related to things falling from heaven, and it related to the physical and it impacted, it says, like a third and a third and a third of different things, and a third of mankind died from that. So you've right now we come into chapter 9, and we're going to look at, okay, a third have already been wiped out of humans. Now uh, we're going to find out, like, next week, another third gets wiped out, but not a third of the original, it's a third of what's remaining. It's a mathematical thing. And then we know in chapter 6, it talks about a fourth being wiped out, and that's a part that that points to the second half of the tribulation. So you got a third, a third, and a quarter, not of the original number, but of each each number as it got diminished, then another third is diminished, and then another fourth. So if we have seven point something billion people now, you can just see how many billions of people are going to be wiped out from this, mostly from the physical stuff, but some of it from the spiritual. This week we're going to look at Revelation chapter nine. Verses 1 through 12, which is like on your notes, you have in the outline. And it's entitled Demonic Uprising, Part 1. This is the fifth trumpet judgment. There are two trumpet judgments that deal with the demonic uprising. And this week we'll just, we're going to whittle at it, at this first one. So this last week, June the 2nd, there was a meteor that came over the Arizona area. And that's a picture right up there. It talks about this asteroid causes a sonic boom. It happened over the Phoenix, Tucson, Sedona area. And it was registered on, on seismic monitors. So it actually hit something where it affected the Earth. But it, they're not saying that it hit the Earth. But the boom itself was enough. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up is, last week we talked about physical things falling from the earth and causing a physical effect. Well, this is a, a thing that was maybe 10 feet in diameter, kind of a, a ball of, of rock. Think of something that looks like a falling mountain on fire that's big enough for you to see that you would say, hey, that looks like a mountain falling from the sky. Just think of the impact from that. That's, that's all I'm doing. This is like a follow-up from last week. And... Uh, is another picture of it, and they, they show this coming down, another angle. It's made some news, and there, there's the seismometer reading from it. I think it was like 1.2 on the Richter scale, but it did something. There was something there. And then here's the actual news, well, it's kind of a news report, but you can listen. Eyewitnesses in Arizona got a surprise early Thursday morning when the sky went from dark to blazingly bright and then back to black. This wasn't a UFO and it wasn't a wayward fireworks display. According to NASA, an asteroid 10 feet, 3 meters, in diameter entered the atmosphere and turned night into day for a brief flashing moment. There are no reports of any damage or injuries, just a lot of light and few sonic booms, Bill Cook of NASA's Meteoroid Environment Office, said in a statement. 
he expects there to be meteorites scattered on the ground north of Tucson, in case anybody would like to forge a replica of King Tut's dagger. NASA released a short video from a meteor camera in Arizona. It shows the asteroid approaching from the top of the screen like a growing pinpoint of light. It then completely saturates the frame like some cosmic flashlight turned up to full brightness. Footage from another camera trained on Sedona showed the impressive strength of the light show as the city's red rock cliffs glow under the fireball's illumination. Asteroids reach Earth's atmosphere every day, but this particular asteroid has the advantage of being both incredibly bright and well documented on video. see it was it was just coming and then it got brighter and then it, it eventually just dissipated it dissipated and exploded or something and uh, so what we're looking at today is the trumpet judgments of another thing that falls from heaven but we're gonna find out it's not physical this one's going to be spiritual it's pretty cool artwork though isn't it that that on the screen there so what we're going to do is we're going to take a few verses and then we're going to expand on it. So we'll look at uh, the first six verses. Then the fifth angel sounded. That is, the fifth angel sounded the trumpet. And I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit and smoke arose. Remember last week we talked about all that smoke. And there was so much smoke that it darkened the sky and a third of the stars and the third of the moonlight and a third of the sunlight couldn't be seen because of all the smoke from those meteorites and the falling stars, etc. This week we talk about something that there's a smoke rose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given the power or authority as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. So in those first six verses, what we see here is um, from the contrast from last week, which was global impact of physical disaster that affected the water, affected the, the air, the atmosphere. Uh, people were dying. A third of mankind died because of those things last week and those are physical and we know that it wasn't just an impact in one region but the ripple effect uh, even there's kind of a pun there because one of them hit the ocean so there would be a ripple effect there would be tsunamis there would be all kinds of things that would have occurred a lot of people died but it was physical and those are real physical things coming from earth i mean coming down to earth from heaven but here's the deal remember god is in charge of those things right so just like God is in charge of the physical last week, he's also in charge of the spiritual. So in Revelation 9, that falling star that comes from heaven is an angelic being. And it says that him, the key was given to him. So instead of a falling star that is a physical thing, in the Old Testament, stars are also viewed as angels. That is, they can be interchangeable. The, the Hebrew word kochab can also be used uh, for the angel to, in that sense, so like a messenger. And this is spiritual that affects physical. So this is the behind the scenes and all of a sudden is visible. These things that come out of the pit, they are seen by humans. And they affect humans because it torments them for five months and they wish they could die, but they're not able to. But it doesn't affect the 144,000 or those who are related to the 144,000. Because anybody who the 144,000 read Christ, they're not going to be affected by this. 
just like we are not affected by demons. You see, there's a, there's a reason that being in Christ, the Holy Spirit being in us, the demonic can't do this to us. We are not under the control of demons. We can't be demon-possessed. We can be attacked by demonic forces. That's a different thing. But this is different. This is tormented by them. Being tormented. So this has to do with um, something that we are exempt from. And I'm glad God said, but not those who have the seal of God in their forehead. So we have the seal of God on the forehead, too. We have the seal of God, the Holy Spirit. And in the demonic realm, they can see it coming out of our forehead. Uh, that's how I view it. In the demonic, the, the spiritual realm, in the spiritual realm behind the scenes, the demons know us. If we are truly born again, they know us. I mean, they know about, they, they go, that one is saved. We have to have a different tactic to ruin his life. Make his life ineffective, but they can't torment us. If you're being tormented by demons, double check to see if you are truly in the faith. Double check to see if you are truly born again. And that's good for us to check that. It would be a bad thing to end up in hell thinking you were, you were saved all that time. And then these specific demons, death does not come from them. Next week, we'll look at the rest of chapter 9, and we'll see that those other demons, there are other demons, and they are released. They will cause death. Another third will die. Here's some stylistic pictures, artwork, of some of what people think they look at based on the description that John is seeing in the next few verses. They, they look like scorpions with stingers. They, they have faces. They have wings. They, 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 they have like bodies like horses, that kind of thing. And so people are trying to capture that. The one in the right here is like you can see the pit opening up. And all these locusts are coming out of the pit with the smoke rising. It's just a way to view and visualize that this is going to be a big impact. And it doesn't say that this is only affecting just a certain area. This may be affecting the whole planet. So John is seeing this, and this is what he's describing, starting in verse 7, and we'll go through verse 12. The shape of the locust was like... Now I want you to pay attention to how John is describing this. He is trying to use similitude. That is, trying to gather... Hey, this is, this is something... Uh, that I can relate to, and I'm trying to relate it to you, trying to give you a picture. It'd be like somebody trying to describe the flavor of grape to you, and you've never tasted grape before. But I have a grape in my hand, but you've never tasted it, so I'm describing to you with what you might be familiar with, what we might be familiar with if we've never tasted grape, you see? So these things John has never seen, but he's trying to describe, and, he's, and of course he's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, He's going to describe, describe this accurately. The shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. What? It has teeth. <laughs> I mean, these things have teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings. What? They have wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. So, of course, I have to go back to Ben-Hur, or some of the movies that I saw, and the clippity-clop, but I've, we've been around horses, but they have multitudes of chariots and horses, and that's a thunderous sound. Going into battle. You know, we haven't, we haven't probably personally seen that or experienced that, but John may have, or other people who John is writing to. They would have experienced that or heard that with the Roman legions going through their towns or something. They had tails like scorpions, and they were stings, or they had stingers in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months. Now he's reiterating what he said earlier. He's trying to say, hey, look, they hurt men for five months, but they're not killing them. And they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, not pit, but pit, whose name is, in Hebrew, Abaddon or Abaddon, but in Greek, he has the name Apollyon. One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. So let's unpack what we just read. 
John is describing what he is looking at and what he sees and hears. He's trying to relate that to us, just like we just said. These are angelic beings, but they're fallen angelic beings. We call them demons. And John says that they look like scorpions. They, they are kind of like scorpions, but they also are like horses marching into battle. Faces like humans. Long hair like women. Teeth like lion's teeth. Breastplates like iron. Very noisy wings. These are demonic beings of some sort. But God set up boundaries. This is the, uh, one of the biggest points that we find in Scripture, like in Job. Remember Job. God set up boundaries to Satan. He says, okay, well, you can do this, but you can't do this. And so these demons, when they came out, were commanded. Now, who is commanding them? Satan or God? God. So that, that would say that the angel that came down was one of God's holy angels who has a key, because we see another holy angel come down to the key, it says the angel with the key to the bottomless pit in chapter 20, and we find out that he brings chain and binds up Satan and puts him into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Now, when Satan's bound, it means Satan and his whole troop of angels and demons. Don't just bind Satan; they have demons running around. It's that's the titular head, and you put them all in. So in this case, here are these beings. Uh, in, the, in this bottomless pit, but they have boundaries. They can only do certain things. And the lesson here for us today, not just in the future, but for us today is that um, Satan and demons, uh, God will use them to accomplish his goals if he wants to. That is, he can use that for his goals. And we'll find out in the rest of the chapter what his goal was. And like we said last week, part of the goal is to bring people to repentance to rip the rug out from under them so they have nothing left to turn to except God. They can either turn to bitterness and hate God, or they can finally be humbled, and God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. So this is all part of the plan that God has. It's also part of filtering, too. Filtering. And then, just like we talked about or we've intimated about in Ezekiel chapter 1 and Revelation 4 and 5, we see these angelic beings like sons of God or living creatures that that have different shapes. These four living creatures that are before the throne of God, they are in a they have interesting shapes. And they have like one has a face of a man, one has a face of a cherubim or a cow, an eagle, etc. So you've got these different faces on them. Well in Ezekiel each one had four faces and there were four creatures. Probably the same four creatures before the throne of God. But then some of them were shaped like wheels. And were spinning, and they were called living creatures. But they weren't living creatures with breath in them, like we are. They are living beings, like angelic beings, which are spiritual beings. So evidently they can shape shift. They can they're multi-dimensional creatures. Think about it. We're limited to three dimensions: length, height, and width. Not so with angelic beings. They are spiritual beings, non-corporeal, that is, without a body. That is, they aren't, but they can shape themselves as if they have a body. I don't know how it works, but they can do it, and we see it all the time. That's why, when you look at Ezekiel chapter 1, and I would encourage you to read it, you go through it, and then you say, wait a minute, metallic-looking things that are shiny, that are circular and spherical, but kind of like this. Didn't that look like those pictures that people have of UFOs? And think about it. The UFOs they find all the time go at tremendous speed and make 90 degree angles. One was clocked at 4,000 something miles an hour. It appeared on radar. And it made a 90 degree angle at that speed. If it was physical, there's no way it could do that. The bounds of physicality here, the, the, the laws of, of physical nature don't allow physical things to do that. That spiritual, physical kind of thing that can appear and do but still affect physical, just like these demons, they're spiritual beings. They're coming out of the pit, but they can affect the physical. Now we see. Now, all of those things don't lead us to Christ. So the, those UFOs probably are something that is from the demonic, because they're always there to deceive us. 
to get us away from the gospel, to get us away from the truth. In the same way, these angelic beings must be able to manifest themselves like this. Now, these are the demons that are described in 2 Peter 2 and Jude, Jude 1. There's only one chapter in Jude, so Jude. They are bound in chains, and Peter uses the word Tartarus, which is only used once in the New Testament. But it is replete throughout ancient Greek mythology, which is interesting that he would use that word. The word is used to bind the titans, who are a, a mixture of half uh, god and half animals or half something, and they, and they were some kind of race of gods or something, and they are bound in Tartarus in chains because they rebelled against God or the gods. Okay, So for some reason, he's using this concept, but using it in a holy way, and again, what's in Scripture is inspired and infallible and inerrant. So we have to believe that the concept or idea that they got that from was something that they got that from and corrupted it. But they got it from what was happening during the flood with the angelic beings marrying the women. And you'll see how this fits. Demons in the bottomless pit. Uh, let's talk about bottomless pit. So let's say you have a basketball. Let's see, the basketball is our earth. Because these demons are coming up out of the earth, the physical earth, right? Okay, so if I had a square, I'd know where the bottom is, right? You, you know, you fall through and you hit the bottom. But if you have a sphere and a gravity point points from the surface inward, where's the bottom? There is a bottom. The center of the earth has no bottom. It is the bottom, right? So there's one little atom there and everybody's stepping on it and that's the bottom. So wherever this is, it's some place where there is no bottom. And the only physical place that could be is the center of the earth. It's very hot, it's very smoky, and uh, just get the picture here. Where are the demons? In a bottomless pit. Now the bottomless pit is a temporary area. This is not a lake of fire that's eternal forever. This is just a temporary holding area where the demons are chained. Remember those demons that uh, were in those um, the Gadarene demoniacs where they were chained and Jesus came up on them and they were beating themselves and the, the townspeople said, no, we have to keep them over here in the caves and they break the chains all the time. And finally Jesus sets them free. The demon says, please, please, don't send us into the abyss. Please, not before our time. Okay, don't, don't send us in. Why? Because they don't want to go there. Because the demons that are down there are worse than them. Because these demons were, have been bound for a long time. Just think what happens if you're bound and you're full of rage and bitterness. And you're multidimensional. What shape are you going to be like when you come out? Mm, think about it. You, you hear a people about people being enraged and want revenge when they go to prison. Just think if you've been there for thousands of years in a hot environment that's uncomfortable and you're in chains. Okay, So they didn't even want to go there. So they said, well, let's throw, throw us in those pigs. And then, of course, the pigs, what'd they do? They went in the, the water, right? Because they're, they're sane. It's like, if I have a demon in me, I'm committing suicide. I don't want a demon in me. People are like, okay, I'm, I'm okay with a demon in me. See how the difference is? Pigs are even smarter. So in this case, the bottom is probably the center of the earth. That is a bottomless pit. There's a reason why it's called a bottomless pit. It tells us where the location is. So it might be that their heat and rage is keeping everything going. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> you know, volcanoes are exploding because of their rage, you know. Yeah. So the king, th this is very interesting. Uh, John is... Uh, kind of focusing on this king, but I, God is wanting him to focus on this king of the bottomless pit. And the reason why is he is the beast that comes up out of the pit. He is the beast. He is the king. He's the leadership demon. And remember, there's a whole class of leadership demons we talked about. Daniel 8, Daniel 10, uh, Ephesians 6 talks about it, uh, principalities and powers, etc. Those are all talked about. So here's something that was bound in the, the pit. And we know that from Peter, 
2 Peter 2 and Jude, we know that those were bound there because of what they did in Genesis 6. We know this because of what 2 Peter 2 and Jude talk about. They left their dominion, and we're going to read these scriptures in just a sec. So let's look up what Abaddon or Abaddon means. Abaddon refers to destruction, death, and disintegration. And here are the references for it. And I think on your notes there, I, I give you the references. It occurs five times in the Old Testament and only once in the New Testament. It is a Hebrew word, of course, is a transliteration. These are English letters used to represent the sounds of what it would be in Hebrew. And it has to do with destruction, death, and disintegration. So this is, this is like personified. That's what this guy is. And this guy is not Satan. Satan has been free to roam the earth. He is not bound in chains. So these guys are very wicked and very powerful. And Apollyon, it almost looks like Apollo, right? There may be some, some uh, root to that because of the power that Apollo has. Apollo is the only Greek uh, god of mythologies that is also the same name in, in the Roman language, in Latin. All the other gods, like Zeus would be Jupiter, Cronus would be Saturn, etc. Uranus is also Saturn. So this, there's something that about the personification of death, destruction, disintegration, chaos. You'd be like the destroyer. The destroyer. Now, that is the essence. That is the essence of this guy. And he has been bound in that pit, but he is the king. That means he was the king before he was thrown in. So he was the leader of the angelic beings, the sons of God, the Bnei Elohim, who came down and intermarried with women. Now how they did that, I don't know. It doesn't describe that, but it shows the fruit of their offspring was called Nephilim, the fallen ones. That's what it means. But in every other language, it's called giants. They were huge, they were powerful, and it makes a note. Men of renown. A better way to say it is heroes or, or famous people that would legends were made from. Legends are made from these guys. Legends like of Hercules and of the Titans and of all these mythologies are coming from this stuff. Now whatever it was, it was so bad that it infected all humanity except for Noah's family. It affected them so bad that God had to bring in the global flood. It affected not just humanity, but it affected animals. Only God chose certain animals that would come on the ark. That is, of the population of every species, certain were selected. He selected them. The reason being is the words used for pure are pure physically, not pure spiritually. That is, they weren't infected by whatever this was. Whatever it was, genetic stuff, I don't know what it was, and it doesn't go into the mechanics, but the Canaanites were delving into it as well. And we know Sodom and Gomorrah did because they wanted to mate with those two angels. That was the, that was the last thing. They went all the way through all the alities, homosexuality, everything. The pinnacle thing would be the last thing, mating again with the angels, having some sort of whatever that is that they would do. They wanted to be with them and know them carnally. That's, that's what God wanted to see. That was the last straw. And if that was the last straw, that was the last straw that was going on in Genesis 6. My spirit will not strive with man forever, he says. I give you 120 years to repent. That's all you got. That was Genesis. So, similar thing will occur, but it won't be that same thing. He's going to release the same angel. So, as it was in the days of Noah... He was a repeat. These are the guys that were in the days of Noah. But now they look like scorpion things. C.S. Lewis has something to say about that. If you ever read Screwtape Letters, he talks about the contortions that go on in, in, in the demonic realm because of not obeying Satan and things. So, it's a, of course, it's a play on, on this, but it gives you a hint. I'm not saying that he's gospel in what he says, but I think he's tapping into the reality of whatever the anger and the bitterness and the and whatever it is, that
contorts these angelic beings into what we see. Anger and bitterness. There's some lessons there, isn't it? Like, what does anger and bitterness do to us? I, you know, in our personality as we relate to other people. It, well, you can see the poison of that anger and bitterness comes out. And that's what we see here in a spiritual sense, but also in a physical sense. It affects us physically. Okay, now we're going to go back to Daniel. And the reason why we're going back to Daniel is we want to look at what's going on in the spiritual realm because we want to talk about these leadership demons. This is Daniel 10, verses 12 through 13. And then we're going to read another little excerpt. And then he, the angel Gabriel, said to me, Daniel, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. Oh, that's good to know. I have been praying for so long. Have you ever heard this? Even from yourself. I've been praying for so long before God. Is he hearing me? Is he hearing me? Well, it says so. From the very first day you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I come because of your words. An angel was dispatched. But it took 21 days. Why? Because, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia was to me 21 days. He's not talking about Artaxerxes. He's not talking about Darius the Mede or any of those physical human beings. He's talking about the spiritual being, the fallen angelic being that's under Satan's echelons, like a general. You know, he's a leadership demon. Remember what I talked about? How Satan said, all of these kingdoms are yours to give to you, Jesus, if you bow down to me. Remember I talked about, he starts from the political side, topward, down. Because he's limited. He, Satan can only do certain things. And so he has a limited amount of resources. He has a limited amount of demons. And so he has to go to the uh, parts of societies and nations that give the most impact and influence, which is politics. I'm sorry to say, but that's true. God can also use politics, and we've seen that in the Old Testament as well. So, and that's what's happening here. Behind the scenes, you have these spiritual players, so to speak, like a video game, so to speak, and they're controlling people. Uh, they're persuading them. They're giving them thoughts and ideas because they're fallen sinful people. The fallen sinful nature is very open to the persuasion power of the enemy. And it isn't Satan himself, it's Satan through all his echelons of ranks of demonic forces, principalities of powers that are out there. Spiritual wickedness in high places, in the heavenlies. And so that's what we're seeing here. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, so at that time, Persia, the empire, was in control. Although God is over all of that and makes sure everything's in its boundaries, all the nitty-gritty of what's going on is you know, kind of like Satan's playground. And one of the players is the prince of Persia. But behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, okay, so that puts him on par with what we're talking about. Satan is a chief prince. Gabriel is a chief prince. And Michael is a chief prince. This is what we know at least from Scripture. And we know that two-thirds of the angels stayed with God, the holy angels. Here's your two commanders of the two-thirds. They're named Gabriel and Michael. And these guys are the ones that are holy. So Satan only has one-third to work with, and he has his commanders, etc., under him. Again, this is all selfish. This, this is something that Satan has to work hard at, I'm sure, because every one of these commanders wants to be the chief guy. They all want everybody to worship him, right? This is where the gods and goddesses come from. This is where all the false religions come from, is this. These... these this over here. So the Prince of Persia is one. You have Michael. He came to help Gabriel. Now understand, that means Michael and his angels came to help Gabriel and his angels. Not just Gabriel himself, but Gabriel and his angels. We'll find out Michael has a set of angels when he's talked about in Revelation 12, where he fights against Satan and Satan's angels. See, there's, there's a group of these guys, and they're fighting against each other. So he came to help him, for I had been left alone there with the king of Persia. 
And that doesn't mean the king of Persia was all by himself and Gabriel was by himself. We're talking armies, hosts of angelic beings in the spiritual realm. Okay. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. That's what we're talking about now. For the vision refers to many days yet come, basically the end times. Now we'll scoot down to verse 20. It says, Then he, the angel Gabriel, said, Do you know why I have come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. The prince of Greece was the demonic force with his demonic angels underneath him. It was behind the force we know as Alexander the Great and his empire that spread and overtook the kingdom or the empire of Persia, Persian Medo-Persian Empire. So this relates ex explicitly or all, all perfectly to Ephesians 6, 10-20, fighting principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this age, the spiritual armies of wickedness in heavenly places, our fight in prayer relates to God's holy angels having the upper hand in the fight. See, it's kind of like when when Joshua was fighting against the Amalekites and Moses was holding up his rod and then he was winning and then all of a sudden the rod went down and then the, Mal the Amalekites were winning. And then so Aaron Hur came up and, you know, put this rock under there and tried to hold up his so that's, it's like standing in the gap, hold up his arm so the rod would stay up. And that's prayer upholding the fight. These are spiritual um, examples of us doing this. So he prayed, Daniel prayed, and because of this, a dispatch was sent and a shift in kingdoms occurred. Okay, understand that. A shift in kingdoms occurred. The impact affected history. Now, of course, Daniel's probably not the only one praying, but he's the one as an example here. We pray in concert for God's kingdom to come, spread, grow, and multiply. We are praying for this kind of thing to be happening behind the scenes. Remember when Jesus talked about, you know, Satan can't fight against Satan, you know. You have the, the, the strong man comes into a person's house and binds the guy, and then he has power. He talked about binding. We talked about those angels being bound or in chains. And then the release from the, from their bindings come up out of the pit, right? We're talking about bindings. So Gabriel has an army, Michael has an army, and Satan has an army, and these leadership demons are under Satan's control at least here. Now we're not talking about those angelic beings that come out of the pit, but we're talking about there was a king over them. Remember, there's a king over those angels coming out of the pit. Now they're going to be assumed into the rankings of Satan because Satan eventually gives the beast who comes out of the pit, his authority. We'll see that in Revelation 13. So the beast that comes out of the pit, Satan gives him his authority so that the whole world worships the dragon. You see how this works? So he will be under Satan's authority again. He was under Satan's authority to corrupt mankind originally. That was Satan's strategy. But those angelic beings were taken and bound in chains in the darkest pits or the bottom of the pit. So the Prince of Persia, Prince of Greece, these are angelic beings who are demonic under Satan's control. These are principalities and powers. It affects politics. What we're seeing even today is affected by the enemy. It is definitely Satan is very much in control of this election cycle. So angels cannot kill angels. Angels don't die. They can't be killed. So what do you have to do? You have to bind them. You must be bound with chains. Some kind of some, something. They call them chains. I don't know what they are. But there's something. All of mythology is replete with this. Binding and chains. And those gods or goddesses don't die. Well, remember I talked about. All those gods and goddesses come from this whole realm of Satan and his demons. That's what they are. Even... Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 8 and 1 Corinthians 10. All the gods and goddesses that other people worship are just demons. These are fallen angels. Jude 1.6 says, And the angels who not, did not keep their proper domain, but left their abode, that means left their home, or left 
their like whatever they are and became something else he has reserved in everlasting chains chains under darkness for the day of the for the judgment of the great day the judgment of the great day is the day of the lord which is the time period of the great tribulation and that's those demons that are coming out of the pit that are like scorpions we're seeing that that's who these demons are coming out of the bottomless pit and uh, these are the same thing as the sons of god pretty scary huh so they are like the days of noah jesus said it would be just like the days of Noah. Well, we're going to have the same players. We're going to have the players that were involved in what was happening in the days of Noah. Plus, of course, our society is getting like that as well. Here's another one, 2 Peter 2.4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, or Tartarus, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, reserved for the time of judgment, Tartarus is the only this is only used once in all of New Testament. We talked about that. And it, it relates to the uh, demigods mixture of heaven and earth. And they were sent to, to Tartarus. The specific demons are bound and are not free to roam the earth. So the ones that are in the pit, they are chained. And uh, so we talked about what would happen if you're chained and bound like that. So Jude quotes from a book called Book of Enoch. This is not a book that's in, in our scriptural canon. I'm only going to look at it from a, for a historical, cultural point of view to show you what people were thinking about and why 2 Peter 2 and Jude quoted from the concepts that are therein. Because the concepts and ideas, the overall concepts and ideas are very true. And again, you can always download this, and this is being recorded right now, so you can download that, and and we can, you can go over this on your own. This is what he says in Jude 1, 14 and 15. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them, of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So this is a quote from the, the book of Enoch. So here's some other quotes that seem to parallel what Jude and Second Peter talk about with these angelic beings. It gives you the background of what everyone at the time of Jesus understood who these demons were, these angels were that are bound in chains in the bottomless pit. It says, bind Azazel hand and foot, throw him into the darkness. He covered his face in order that he may not see light, and in order that he may be sent into the fire on the great day of judgment. Another one, Enoch uh, 10, 11 through 12. Now again, this is not inspired scripture, we're not, but we're talking about something that Jude quotes from, and Peter quotes concepts from bind Semjaza and the others who are with him who fornicated with the women that they will die together with them in all their defilement bind them for 70 generations underneath the rocks of the ground until the day of their judgment and of their consummation until the eternal judgment is concluded another verse uh, chapter 20 verses 1 through 2 and these are the names of the holy angels to watch over the angels, Uriel, one of the holy angels, for he is over the world, and Tartarus. There's that word again, Tartarus. Uh, Enoch um, 12.4, go and make known to the watchers of heaven. Now, watchers of heaven are in Daniel. They're mentioned in Daniel, the watchers. The watchers of heaven who have abandoned their high heaven, the holy eternal place, and have defiled themselves with women. That tells you what, what is meant there about them leaving their proper domain, leaving their abode or their home, and they have defiled themselves with women. And uh, Enoch 15, 3, verse 3 and 7, For what reason have you abandoned the high, holy, and eternal heavens and slept with women, defiled yourselves with the daughters of the people? I did not make wives for you for the proper dwelling place of spiritual beings of heaven is heaven. 
So it shows you the thinking behind and the understanding in the culture. And of course, this parallels exactly with Jude 1 6 and 2 Peter 2 4. It gives you the understanding who these angelic beings are. The understanding that, that Jude and Peter have with the readers, because Enoch was also available during that time. And in fact, in some versions of the Septuagint version at their time, it was included along with the Maccabees, the first and second Maccabees. First Enoch is in there as well. And since it was part of the Septuagint that was given out, people would subscribe to it as being part of the Bible. Now, the New Testament people did not want that in there because there were some other things in there about like Adam being 30 feet tall and some other things. So whatever translation they had of whatever it was wasn't preserved. So there were some parts that were like, well, I think I'm going to have a second look. But the things that relate to these angelic beings are spot on with everything, including the Son of Man. There's a whole description of who the Son of Man is. It expands on what Daniel says in Daniel 7 about who the Son of Man is. The Son of Man is going to be the Messiah, and the Son of Man is eternal, pre-existed, and he's coming to save the world, and all this, the divine Son of Man. So what we're seeing here is this. It, it defeats the understanding that came, I'd say, later on in the 1600s to try to figure out who are these sons of God intermarrying with the daughters of men. One theory was it was the sons of Seth intermarrying with the daughters of Cain, and it corrupted the race. Well, we had intermarriages all throughout. God didn't wipe them all out. This was definitely it's a specific phrase, Ben Elohim, which means sons of God, and it's very specific. So in this case, uh, what we look at here, these are angelic beings that fell and did something that they weren't supposed to, and they had a they did produce offspring. So whatever they did to themselves to make themselves to be able to do that, that was the corruption, and it corrupted and infected humanity. But it wasn't forced on us as humans. It was accepted and we were willing. So whatever it was, it was a willing thing. It wasn't forced on us. It was something like, yes, come. We want you. Because they had rejected God. So when they rejected God, they're going to turn to something else. Pretty amazing, huh? So that's who these demons are. That gives you the history and background of these demons. These demons that are coming up out of the pit are the very demons that were the ones that fell in Genesis 6. And they were bound in the pit. Not all angels are like that. Uh, like the devil and his angels that are here on earth, that are roaming the earth, they weren't the ones that were those angels. These angels that are roaming the earth are bound in chains. They're roaming the earth causing chaos. But God still has control over them, just like he has the demons that will come out of the pit that control. You remember, the lake of fire is the forever and ever place. It's The bottomless pit is temporary. In every case, it's temporary because those demons come out of the bottomless pit and Satan is released after a thousand years out of the bottomless pit. It's temporary. It's a temporary holding place, but it's for the demonic. It's for angels, not for people. Lake of fire, Jesus talks about, was created for the devil and its angels. But humans will also be thrown there, too. So the original um, place for the devil and the angels for their punishment, God created that originally only for the devil and the angels. So that tells you that was existing, waiting, before mankind was ready to go. So it kind of tells you that, okay, you're going to go where the devil goes, but that was originally just created for the devil and his angels. So that's why I'm warning you, don't go there. You know, that wasn't originally made for mankind. The earth was made for mankind to rule over and to have enjoyment with God. Amen? So how does this affect us? The, the future of these demonic beasts coming out of the pit, how does this relate to us? Well, we have to remember this. If we're in Christ, we are never under any condemnation. No condemnation in any way, shape, or form. Jesus took all of our condemnation. That which comes out of that pit is a part of God's condemnation, is a part of God's judgment, because the trumpet judgments are trumpet judgments and they're under the control of Jesus because it relates to Jesus unrolling the scrolls 
And those are his angels, Jesus' angels, doing the trumpet blasts. They all stem from Jesus doing this. So that, in no way, shape, or form, is anybody under that condemnation. The demons that come out of the pit or demons today, they're all under constraints. They're ba they have boundaries. And God uses demons for his purpose. He needs to drive people to the cross to scare the hell out of them. And you might wonder, well, why does God allow Satan? Why does God allow the demons? Why did why do you just kill them or, or put them in the lake of fire to begin with? Well, first off, we had to have a choice in Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve had to have a choice or we have no love. You can't trust and have love and all, all that goes into a loving relationship without choice. Otherwise, you're just a robot. Dogs don't really have choices. Animals, insects, they don't have choices. They just follow the instincts and do their thing. What? So a shark that eats a person? Is it the shark's fault? Oh, we should blame that shark. How did that shark choose to? No, he's just doing his thing. See? But humans have choices. So God had to have a choice. He's going to use Satan, even after he fell in the spiritual realm, to continue his fall in judgment in the physical world and to give people choices. But once we had the sinful nature, it's similar to how firefighters fight fire with fire. Now he's going to employ the sinful kinds of things in life to show us to our face how sinful we are. He's using all of that to cause us to show us how sinful sin can be. When a, when a person who is not saved looks at someone else and says, how dare they do that? They have that sense of justice, that sense of, of morality, and yet they do other things that are kind of similar but in a different way, and just as sinful maybe. Paul takes that up in Romans chapter 2. How dare you, O oh man, call this man a sinner when you're just as bad? And that's what why God allows that. You see someone who's real prideful and Maybe that affects you. It's like, ah, I got, oh, maybe I got some pride. And all of those are to drive the sinner to the cross. Not to blame God, but to show him right in their face. You want a prime example of selfishness and, and narcissism and everything? There's Satan. And then there's other people who are like him. Do you want to end up that way? Some people, yeah, they do. Others like, no. There's that sense of justice, sense of truth, sense of morality still left. And God can use that conscience. And fighting fire with fire is why God allows that. Number three, the urgency of the gospel. If we really love people. We don't want them to go through this period of time. The urgency of the gospel is we have to warn them. We have to get out of our comfort zone and share with them the gospel. Do we care for people? Do we love people? And that's why I had you all put stickers on these uh, flyers, these little dollars and bucks and things, so that we could... Start sharing them. Go out and try to figure out where we can start putting these on cars or whatever. We have to get out. We have to get out of our comfort zone. It's nice to, to know God and love him, learn the word of God, worship together, encourage and build each other up. We need to do that for a purpose so that we can reach out. We need to pray and work and, and work hard for the gospel. The pastor asked me, hey, so do you have a work here on John's Island? You notice the way you said that. Do you have some? You have a work here, a work of the gospel here. And I said, well, we're we're trying. We're going we're going to try to plant a church here. And then we end up with praying affects the spiritual realm. There's much more impact than we could do working, but we still need to do something. We still need to flesh out our our faith walk with God in doing something. Uh, but we need to pray, and pray comes first. With all of this, praying comes first. And we saw how Daniel affected history with his prayer. The shift of kingdoms. I don't know if my prayers are doing that. But it gives me encouragement that God hears me the very moment that I'm praying, even though I don't feel like he is. He is hearing me the very first moment. And it affects nations, industry, and people. Amen? So let's, uh, let's uh, conclude with this, uh, with this last song.